Hello, and welcome to this podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Giga Turk. Giga is a professor at the University of Ljubljana, Slovenia. He holds degrees in engineering and computer science. As academic, he studies design communication, internet science, and scenarios of future global developments with a focus on the role of technology and innovation. He is an internationally recognized author, public speaker, and lecturer on these subjects. Giga was Minister for Growth, as well as Minister of Education, Science, Culture, and Sports in the Government of Slovenia. He was also Secretary General of the Felipe Gonzalez Reflection Group on the Future of Europe. His past activities outside of academia and policymaking include a stint as chairman of the supervisory board of Telecom Slovenia and Mobitel. Okay, Giga, you know about our three plus one format. You get three questions and one soapbox moment. Let me put the first question on screen and read it out loud. So how do you interpret the relationship between users accessing more content and services online and the impact this may have on telecom operators? Well, I think the explosion of internet services has been great, actually, for telcos. Those who say that it has not been great hope that the monopoly of the telcos on voice communication and fax messaging would last forever. But the revenues of telcos have been shifting from voice and text to data. Voice and short text messages were dead ends anyway. There's no increase of revenue possible because people only talk so much. So the shift to data opened up an array of new possibilities for the telcos. Data, of course, is the internet and internet services. Um, it started, as we all know, in the 90s with uh, textual emails, textual web pages, still picture, and then sound was added and video with increasingly high resolution video and now gaming. and after COVID or during COVID, not to mention the business users of the internet, working from home, teleconferencing, telemedicines, distance collaboration, etc., etc. Many services have been invented that required more and more bandwidth, and telcos were well positioned to offer that. They did not invent any of the services, but could offer the infrastructure for them and charge for it. A user's appetite for more bandwidth has been increasing, and people were willing to pay for that. Also, Moore's law was keeping the cost down. Every year or two, the cost to transfer an amount of data basically halved. Transfer of more, more data sometimes enabled the telcos to charge more money to the end users. The bandwidth is now approaching the sensory limits of the human body. It's only that high a resolution that you can see. So at some point, not much more growth would be possible only perhaps new revenue sources, such as from the providers of services that made this initial growth possible in the first place. So while telcos have been increasingly vital to provide the infrastructure for the internet services, they have been, frankly, losing prestige. They are not a monopoly service to connect people with voice, text, and faxes. They are just infrastructure, a utility, and yeah, maybe the glory is someplace else. This may be painful, others are making more money, but rightly, deservingly so. Internet companies were the ones who were creative, who invented new services, and it was actually the internet companies that kept the telcos relevant. Telcos are infrastructure. Even the monopoly they had with cables underground is disappearing. Citizens and businesses have a choice where and how to connect to the internet, and the telcos are not the only option. It's actually funny because that, that idea of prestige and, and, and losing um, their sexy touch <laughs> to a certain extent comes back with a lot of people uh, that I interview on the, on the podcast. And um, I, I think, you know, having a utility and offering a commodity that is as necessary as we have experienced during COVID is actually quite a nice business to be in um, and, and not one that we should co I, I complain on. I mean, if I look at the next generation, uh, connectivity is there everything. I think they would 
rather have Wi-Fi than food half of the time if you gave them the choice. Um, which makes me um, go to the next element, having having looked at the, the positive aspect of more consumption of content and services. What are the inherent dangers, if any, of big tech being requested uh, to pay for the network of telcos? Yeah, I mean, maybe going a little back to, to the discussion uh, you just started. I mean, telcos were, you know, they were the companies that were connecting people, that were putting society together, together with the old media. It was a kind of higher calling, but as you were saying, um, also providing this vital infrastructure is not a bad business to be in. But going to the danger first, it has to be made clear that the big tech does pay to be connected to the internet, just like you and me. Uh, they are actually paying much more since their connection speed is much higher. But indeed, they are paying less per me megabyte because of the economies of scale. But the principle is the same. If I set up my own server, and I was doing that in the 90s, to offer an internet service, I would be paying someone to have it connected to the internet. And so does the big tech. I mean, they already are doing that. Now, as users of the internet, you and I pay maybe 20, maybe 50 euros to connect our homes to the internet. Zero of that money goes to the providers of the services, to the authors of the text that we read on the internet, or to the videos, to the authors of the videos that we watch. It's just to be connected. And now the largest chunk of that cost, by some estimates, more than half, is related to the cost of connecting the last mile, the cabling and the devices that bring that bridge the last part of, of land and bring the internet to our homes. These costs vary, of course, in cities it could be cheaper, in villages where the cabling is longer is more expensive. But why would big tech fund the cable that goes into my home or the 5G tower through which I get mobile internet? They already pay for the cable that connects them to the internet and for the traffic that they occur in transit. I mean, should they be paying more just because they are offering a useful service and they are rich. Um, you're asking about the dangers, and I think the dangers are the following. First, um, what big tech would have to pay to the telcos would in the end have to be covered by some revenues of the big tech, which they would extract from the users. And European users would be finding some services that they now enjoy for free to be available for pay, or they would be even more aggressive advertising. We have to be sure there is no such thing as a free lunch. Second, the windfall revenues that the telcos would be getting could be making them even less competitive. Capital would be transferring from an efficient industry with high added value, the internet companies, the, the big tech if you want, to less efficient industries of the telcos. And the ecosystem as a whole would be less efficient. That big tech is American and telcos are European, frankly, does not make the scheme, the, the scheme any more noble or patriotic. Thirdly, it would destroy the market and competition. Telcos are not the only providers of internet infrastructure, but would be the only ones receiving handouts from the big tech. Fourthly, it would destroy the principle of net neutrality that we fought very hard for. Big tech would be forced to pay for the infrastructure and in exchange for that they would be rightly to expect that their traffic is treated in a better way than the traffic of others. That would be, they would be in a better position than startups. This would mean the end of internet neutrality to treat all traffic equally. There would be big, tra big tech traffic and there would be everybody else's traffic. And finally, the extra burden on the internet services would slow down the innovation in the internet services and put in question any developments of bandwidth intensive services, new bandwidth intensive services. If I'm sure if we had this solution 15 years ago, if the service providers would have to pay for their own infrastructure or chip in into the infrastructure, the internet of today would be very different. It would be very worse than what we have now. I think um, th that's uh, the main message I get out of that is nothing can be seen in isolation on the internet. You can't just say 
oh, well, this is a problem of telcos and big tech and they'll sit in a room and, you know, make a deal or the regulator will force them to make a deal and it will not have an impact on the rest of the internet ecosystem. Basically, there will be a cascading effect. And as we see at the moment with other utilities like energy, the end user is the one paying at the end um, the, 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 the added uh, cost that uh, businesses get. Um, maybe a more technical question then for the last one, a, a bit more precise. Do you think it is appropriate to compare the contribution of big tech and telcos in infrastructure as suggested by some, some being mostly telcos? <laughs> No, uh, it's not. Uh, they're in different businesses. I mean, the big tech invested in new services. Uh, they created new needs of consumers. They created a whole new industry. Their job is not to create infrastructure. We have to understand that the key factor that made the internet and all related technologies such a success was that it, it, that it created a common communication infrastructure for any kind of services. Before the internet, if we remember 20, 30 years back, if you wanted to offer a one-to-one -one service, voice service, like telephone, you would need to create your own infrastructure, lay cables, build telephone exchanges, and so on. You would even have to manufacture your own devices like telephones. And if you wanted to set up a music service, you would need to create another separate infrastructure, the radio station, transmission towers, manufacturers, separate devices like the radios our grandmothers are still listening to and likewise for the tv so before the internet we could count all the communication services on the fingers of one maybe two hands and internet changed all that because communication was supposed to be digital only one infrastructure to transfer digital information is needed and only devices that can handle digital information are needed. You can get all the services on one or two devices like a computer or a mobile phone. So the infrastructure was there and anyone with an idea of a service could create it. And we now have millions of apps that provide useful tools to happy users. This model dies if service providers have to start setting up or contributing to infrastructure. Frankly, it's a, it's a kind of Robin Hood approach to look at who is successful and try to slap a fine or a tax or a contribution because they are believed to be able to pay. If the, service, if the service providers feel that the infrastructure is not good enough for them, they can and are investing in infrastructure companies. Putting a special tax on them would be like adding a special tax on successful businesses that, you, that use water or electricity for the use of water or electricity just because they're making something very valuable out of water and electricity uh, and not something less valuable. And this actually tells you that you're shifting resources from more efficient to less efficient industries. And I think there's also another element. European Union has been for, decade, for decades now jealous on American success with the internet economy. And every now and then it believes it could make itself competitive making life harder for the successful American companies. Everybody knows this will not make Europe competitive. And frankly, in the end, it looks a little bit like a revenge. Yeah, I, I think generating or creating the right incentives is very important. Uh, and as you mentioned, maybe um, an approach where you do taxes and where you just look at who's successful and who's in difficulty and then you match them up is maybe not building um, uh, incentives for more efficiency, more innovation and uh, better services to customers and better uh, response to, to demand. We're reaching that glorious moment, <laughs> the soapbox moment, as we call it. Um, I've, I've put on screen uh, Ursula von der Leyen, president of the European Commission, Roberta Metzola, president of the European Parliament, um, there is no way of, of um, having a, one symbolic person representing the council, I'm afraid. That would be a lot of heads of state and government I'd have to put on there. Um, 
what is the short message that you want to deliver on this topic to the powers that be in the EU? Ladies, the internet created a fantastic infrastructure that supports human creativity and innovation. As a network with rather inexpensive access and mostly free or advertising supported services, it contributed significantly to equality and equal opportunity between rich and poor inside of countries and global. All this was achieved well before the politicians thought they know better, before politicians saw, dared to pick winners or recognized the internet as a potential milk cow. Politics should, should stay away and let the various stakeholders, big tech, small tech, service providers, infrastructure providers, telcos, work out their relations among themselves. It has worked out in the past and it will work in the future. I think the picking the winners uh, is, is the key message I took out of that soapbox moment. The beauty of the internet, I think, for us that remember the pre-internet era, which you know, is your case and mine, um, is that that was the first opportunity for, her, for us to really have choice and for control to switch to users in terms of who we would access with what and when. Um, and I, I take your message and I hope that, you know, the ladies you addressed will take it on board also. Um, the winners are so much better when they're picked by all of the users rather than a couple uh, policymakers. Um, thank you so much for your contribution, Shiga, and I think the discussion will continue, but let's hope that all of the input we bring to it will help uh, shape it in the right way. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation, for the opportunity. I hope the internet stays as much as possible the way it was in the, in the good old days.